Welcome back everybody to our lecture introduction to quantum optics. Today we want to return to the Marcinda interferometer and discuss how we can use the general relations of the beam splitter, the quantum beam splitter we introduced in the last class, to look at the quantum version of the Marcinda interferometer. But first let's take a step back and look at the classical version of the Marcinda interferometer again. So here I've sketched out our beam splitter that we discussed in the last lecture with classical inputs E1, E2 and classical outputs E3, E4 and we think of these as complex fields then we can just write a relation down between the output fields and the input fields through these complex reflection and transmission coefficients that we introduced in the last class. Now if you look at this Marcinda interferometer you can actually see it also has two input ports and it also has two output ports. So in a sense it looks very similar to kind of a generalized beam splitter with generalized coefficients, reflection and transmission coefficients that we'll have to determine that relate the input fields to the output fields. So what are these generalized reflection and transmission coefficients of the Marcinda interferometer? Well, let's take a look, for example, the light coming in on port 1, how that arrives at port 3. So how does that light from E1 arrive at port 3? What are the possibilities for that to occur? Well, there are two possibilities. First, the light can be reflected here, can propagate along a path Z1 here, and be reflected again at the second beam splitter. So we have two reflections and a phase shift due to the propagation along the path uh, with the phase shift e to the ik's at 1. And each beam splitter gives us a reflection coefficient r. So we have twice two beam splitters gives us an r squared times e to the ik z1. But that's not the only way how light on port E1 can arrive on port E3. What can also happen is that the light coming in here is transmitted, propagates along path z2 here and is transmitted on the second beam splitter again. So now we have t squared times the phase shift due to the propagation along the lower path and that's just e to the i k z2. So in general you see that the light coming in on port 1 can propagate along two paths and the output field is a superposition of these kind of input fields split up into those two paths. Now let's take a look at, for example, the light coming in on port 2. How can that arrive on port 3? Well, there are basically now two possibilities. It can be first reflected, propagate on this path, and then transmitted, or first transmitted, and then reflected, propagating along the other path, the upper path. And this is just now given then by R times T, times the propagation phases along those two ports. Finally, there's another one Another possibility that we need to discuss that makes this kind of generalized beam splitter, the Marcinda as a generalized beam splitter, a little bit different from the symmetric beam splitters we introduced. Look at how the light on port 2 is related to the light on port 4. The light coming in on port 2 can be first reflected here, propagate along this path, and be reflected here again, giving rise to this phase factor. Or it can be transmitted first, propagate along the other path, the upper path and be transmitted again, giving rise kind of to this kind of transmission and uh, phase shift corresponding to the transmission along those two beam splitters and the propagation path that we have on the upper direction. So this gives us a general relation now between the input fields of this Marcinda interferometer and the output fields of the Marcinda interferometer, just in a classical description. So now, of course, we can use this to calculate things. For example, how the light intensity is, for example, on detector 4 or detector 3, if we look at the output light coming out of these two kind of ports. And uh, so now let's take a look at a situation where we have no classical light coming in on port 2. So we can forget about this term here. And if we want to calculate the light intensity that we have on port 3, for example, that will just be proportional to norm E3 squared, where E3 now again is our complex uh, electromagnetic field. So what's the proportionality constant? You remember what the proportionality constant was between the intensity of the light field and norm of the electromagnetic field of the electric field vector squared. Did you get it right? Well, let's forget about this proportionality constant for a second. Let's just remind us that uh, 
intensity is proportional to uh, norm E3 squared on the output port 3. And then just norm E3 squared, well, that's just now norm of this complex generalized reflection coefficient squared times norm E1 squared, the input light intensity. And likewise for port E4. So E4 now, for example, let's do the calculation. Let's plug in our complex transmission coefficient of the Marcinda interferometer. And that would be just norm R squared, norm T squared, times norm of e to the i k z1 plus e to the i k z2 squared times norm e1 squared. And if you multiply this out, this will just give you four times norm r squared, norm t squared, cosine squared of k times z1 minus z2 divided by two, norm e1 squared. And k times z1 minus z2, that's just the path, the phase difference we pick up along the two propagation paths. If the two paths are exactly equal in length, we have zero phase difference. If they are pi out of phase, then we can expect something like destructive interference between the two waves propagating along those two paths. So let's take a look first of all at the case when we, for example, we have no path difference, z1 equals z2, so this is zero, so cosine evaluates to one, so all the light comes out uh, at the top part of the beam splitter, for example, if we have 50% reflection and 50% transmission on each of the beam splitters, okay? So then we'll have all light coming out, for example, for a 50-50 beam splitter. If we plot the phase difference between upper and lower path and the output intensity, for example, on port four, then we see for zero path length difference, the two waves constructively interfere and all the light comes out on port four, then there will be a zero and up again, zero up again. And the zero occurs precisely when we have pi phase shift constructive again interference for 2 pi, destructive interference again for 3 pi. Now what about the complementary detector? If you want to look at the intensity on port 3, what would that look like? Well, the sum of the intensities always has to equal the input intensity. So that just has to give you the complementary signal. So this would have to look like this, where they are just pi out of phase. So this would be the intensity of the light measured on port 3, just being pi out of phase with the intensity of the light measured on port 4. All right, so that's again just the classical result. So now let's turn to a more interesting situation because now we're in a situation where we can dis discuss this for any quantum state impinging onto such a Marcinda interferometer. And now what we have to do, of course, just as for the beam splitter, we just have to relate the destruction operators of the field of the input fields to the destruction operator to the output fields. And we do this through the same generalized Marcinda coefficients that we introduced for the classical case. So now we have the quantum Marcinda, and now I can use any input state here and calculate what I get as an output state. So for example, what we could do, we could take a single photon state, put a single photon on a port one and the vacuum and port two and ask what is the average photon number, for example, I measure on port four. Now, what you might say is that for a single photon, the single photon will have to decide whether it propagates along the upper path and or, or along the lower path. And then on this final beam splitter, there's a 50 chance, 50% 50 chance of the photon coming out here and a 50% chance of a photon coming out here. So maybe there could be no interference in such a situation. But actually what we see is that there is interference even for the case of a single photon impinging onto our Marcinda interferometer. And that's really quite remarkable. So why could we expect this? Well, remember in the last class on the beam splitter, when we put a single photon on a beam splitter, we actually created an entangled state between the field modes of the photon being in an equal superposition of the upper propagation path here of our Marcinda interferometer 
and the lower propagation path of the Marcinda interferometer. And therefore, we can have interference effects whenever we have such superposition states. But let's just do the calculation. If you're not convinced by our intuition, let's just do our calculation with the formalism we have. So we want to calculate the intensity on, on port 4, which is proportional to the average photon number on port 4. These are the input states, uh, the single photon on port 1, vacuum on port 2, and we have the number operator measuring kind of the photons in port 4. And now, of course, when we want to calculate this over the input states, we have to replace these through the kind of input-output relations through the corresponding operators in modes 1 and 2. Replace using input-output relations. Okay, so let's do that. Let's now take these operators. So this would be just zero photons in mode two, one photon in mode one. And now I have A4 dagger A4 here. One, one, zero, two. And now I just put in my A4 operator using these input-output relations, and that would just give me 0, 1, 1. A4 dagger will be T star Marcinda A1 dagger plus R prime star Marcinda A2 dagger multiplied by T Marcinda A1 plus R prime Marcinda A2 acting on the input state 1, 1 in mode 1 and vacuum state in mode 2. And now when you multiply this out, just in the case of the uh, single photon on the beam splitter, the only term that remains is the one of this T star Marcinda A1 dagger multiplied with T Marcinda A1. All the other terms you can check for yourself cancel out to zero, so the only thing we're left is with is norm T Marcinda squared 0, 1, 1, A1 dagger, A1, 1, 1, 0, 2, and that's just, of course, 1. That's just 1. So this just gives us norm T Marcinda squared, and that's just exactly the classical result. That's exactly what we got for the classical result. That's 4 times norm T squared, norm R squared, times cosine squared of k times z1 minus z2 divided by 2. So we see for the average photon number that we detect after repeating the experiment over many, many times. So you send a single photon into the interferometer, you measure it on one of your detectors. Either detector three clicks or detector four clicks. You repeat the experiment again, three or four clicks. You average over those detection events and then what you find for the average result of the average number of photons you found on detector 4, that it exactly gives you the classical result which shows interference between the two paths. And again, the reason why this works for the single photon state is because the single photon was put into a superposition of propagating along the upper and lower paths and therefore we can have interference even in the case of a single photon impinging on such a Marcinda interferometer. That's all I wanted to tell you today about the Marcinda interferometer. You can again now, using the same formalism, calculate the outputs of a Marcinda interferometer for any kind of input state. And in the next class, we'll look at a special way of how we can use it to actually detect the quadrature components of the electromagnetic field. Thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next class.